Again, a pleasant afternoon to everyone. Uh, we have with us today Under Secretary of Energy Loretta G. Ison and Chair of the Energy Working Group, Dr. Phyllis Yoshida. The Under Secretary and the Chair will deliver their respective statements. Ma'am. Um, a pleasant afternoon to all our friends from the media. Uh, we are, I would like to thank you at this point for the cooperation you've been extending to us in the energy sector. Uh, specifically now that we're hosting the 12th APEC Energy Ministers Meeting. Um, Dr. Yoshida. Okay. I uh, shall begin by thanking the Philippines for the excellent uh, preparations and logistics for this meeting. Uh, we've had extremely good discussions this morning on recommendations that the ministers will make to move APEC forward as a whole to have a more sustainable energy system. In particular, uh, we foresee doing a great deal more work out of this ministerial on issues of energy resilience, which are very important to the Philippines and uh, very important to the rest of the APEC economies. Uh, thank you, Under Secretary and Dr. Yoshida. Uh, before we proceed to the Q&A, may I please request the members of the media who will be asking questions to please raise your hand first and wait to be recognized before uh, approaching the mic in the middle, and that you please introduce yourself and the media entity that you are representing. In addition, may I please re respectfully request everyone to ask uh, APEC-related questions only, and to ask all your questions now, because our resource persons will not be entertaining questions afterward. And with that said, the floor is now open. Yes, ma'am. Good afternoon, I'm Michelle Orosa Oble from TV5. May we know what sort of recommendations were put on the table by the APEC member economies and also what has the Philippines put on the table? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have directions from uh, leaders over the last few years to work specifically on some areas including uh, increasing doubling renewables in the area, decreasing energy intensity, and reforming inefficient fossil fuel subsidies. So we talked a lot about next steps in those areas and next steps in all the areas. The Energy Working Group deals with everything from advanced coal technologies through uh, renewables, energy efficiency. I think the main uh, new uh, piece at this ministerial will be setting up a good work program related to energy resilience and climate change. About your question on what the Philippines has put forward in this particular, in this uh, EMM 12, uh, firstly, the energy resiliency, this team, uh, we, we have coined the word towards an energy resilient APEC community. This is an idea coming from the Philippines of all the APEC meetings. This is the first time that energy resiliency is adopted. So we, we thought of this uh, theme of energy resiliency, considering the fact that Philippines and the other APEC economies have been experiencing uh, devastations from typhoons and a lot of man-made and natural disasters. So we believe that it is timely that we take up energy resiliency of, uh, uh, of infrastructures so that we're able to uh, have that ability, that quality of energy infrastructure which are able to uh, withstand extreme uh, conditions, weather conditions, and they're able to recover and go back to normalcy at a very efficient manner and timely manner and at the end of the day, be able to be build back better. So this is one contribution of the Philippines to the APEC Energy Minister's meeting. And there were specific actions that were uh, formulated by the senior officials on energy leaders uh, coming from 10, 21 APEC economies. Thank you. Do you have any more questions? Yes, ma'am.
Good day. I am Rizal Alchandra from the Philippine Daily Inquirer. Uh, could you update us on what uh, sort of commitments you expect from the CEOs who will be dialoguing with energy ministers? I ask this because the Energy Efficiency Sub Fund committed about $100,000 for your program or your, pro your proposed project for Energy Resiliency Workshop which will result in guidelines for APIC economies that want to participate. Is there, are there similar initiatives that you expect CEOs of attending companies to commit to or invest in? Uh, I think you're referring to the energy ministers and CEOs dialogue that will happen tomorrow morning. Uh, this is more of an energy promotion of energy in trade and investment. So we believe that the role of the private sector is very important in as far as uh, putting in place energy projects, power generation and power distribution uh, for us to move forward to our programs in, an, in the energy sector so that uh, we're able to meet the increasing demand for power and energy. Dr. Yoshida, you want to share something? Right. Um, as governments, we certainly cannot put the amount of investment needed into new resilient infrastructure in APEC. So we meet with industry, with CEOs, et cetera, to get um, their recommendations and views on what makes the most sense for us to do and uh, to encourage them to work in public-private partnerships to invest more throughout the region. Do we have any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Michelle, again from TV5, are we expecting any sort of um, incentives from the APEC member economies from this? Uh, from these discussions, especially when it comes to the kind of infrastructure that we will, uh, we are encouraging to share with each other to climate-proof, so to speak, the energy uh, facilities in the economies. Yeah, I'm not quite clear what you mean by incentives. What we do in APEC is we provide and share best practices on what needs to be done, and then each member economy itself. Uh, builds upon the information exchange, the demonstration projects, uh, the technologies and standards that we do together to create their own policies and programs to reinforce uh, the areas that we're looking at. In other words, this is more of a, of a cooperation work among the 21 APEC economies. So we help out each other in uh, capacity building, uh, best practices sharing, information sharing, so that we're able to help out each other in doing their energy work, and depending on the individual circumstances of each APEC economy. We have time for two more questions. Yes, ma'am. Good afternoon. I'm Joyce Balancer from UNTV. Um, um, we all know that the Philippines, uh, uh, we shared to APEC economies how we are always experiencing calamities every year. So what is our greatest contribution, especially in the talks of um, energy resilience, in, especially in the talks of calamities? So what have we contributed particularly on that? As contribution, uh, we, we, we presented the concept note on uh, doing energy resiliency in off-grid areas. Uh, this means that we're going to do some workshops inviting experts from the different APEC economies. And at the end of the day, we hope to be able to come up with a manual or set of documents that would compile, put together best practices so that when calamities uh, or disasters, either man-made or, or natural, uh, would, would go in a certain economy, these guidelines should be able to, to help out. And it's uh, something of, of a documentation that we want to attain. 
And we also submitted uh, an entry to the low carbon model town. This is Mandawe. So we just keep our fingers crossed that uh, we will get it. Uh, other uh, economies which submitted entries are Russia and, and Malaysia. So announcement will be done tomorrow. So I hope it's something good for us. And uh, we also uh, put in place, uh, as by way of suggestion, uh, in the, both in the minist Cebu ministerial declaration and the instructions, uh, some doable projects that could be undertaken among the, the 21 APEC economies so that we can attain energy resiliency and we have always subscribed to the fact that energy resiliency promotes energy security and sustainable development. Do you want to add up? I agree. Um, the lady in black, ma'am, you were raising your hand a while ago. Yes, ma'am. Hi, ma'am. Alena from Manila Standard. Um, what do we expect to gain after this, especially for the DOE? Do we expect to come out with uh, certain standards on um, uh, energy uh, resilient uh, power plants for that matter? So will we be seeing in the future power plants that will withstand this uh, um, devastating damages of climate change? Thank you. Okay, so... Actually, in the document, that piece of document we work on today, uh, it's just a final trap that the SOE leaders have come up with, but still to be reviewed by the ministers tomorrow, and hopefully they will adapt and approve of this um, uh, declaration as well as instructions. So we, 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 we uh, uh, included among several propo uh, proposals something like vulnerability assessment of the energy infrastructures, coming up with standards so that um, they could withstand uh, the extreme conditions brought about by disasters. And we also would like to do some geohazard maps, all to be uh, initiated by the Energy Working Group. Uh, Dr. Yoshida is the lead shepherd of that Energy Working Group. We always call EWG. And she, she as lead shepherd, as our, uh, she's being helped by some energy working groups and then the, 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 the APORC and the APSEC. So these are to be um, prescribed and we hope that all the APEC economies by this agreement and, and cooperation, I should say more cooperation, will be able to do all this um, uh, vulnerability assessment, uh, geohazard maps, and then best practices sharing. We have some experts from some economies that could help out, especially Philippines, always visited by <laughs> strong typhoons. So, I think uh, we and the other economies stand to benefit right. from this exercise. I think the Philippines and the United States in particular, uh, as many of you know, we experienced a megastorm, Hurricane Sandy, a few years ago, and uh, we weren't, and Katrina, and we weren't totally prepared in those parts of the countries for some of what happened. So we've been learning best lessons, learning uh, how to use advanced microgrids, et cetera, to build resilience into the system. The Philippines has been doing the same. Uh, others in Southeast Asia have experienced differences in waterfall and to hydropower is affected by extreme weather. Uh, certainly in California, we had some extreme droughts recently. So it's really using everybody's best skills and best intelligence from throughout the region to work together to come up with better plans and better ways of doing things. Yes, ma'am. Okay. <laughs> well, some 
somehow related to the question earlier of Miss Elena. I'm just adding on from PNA. Uh, where will we also be seeing a uh, energy resilient transmission line and distribution lines, uh, specifically under the ground? Will that be part of uh, the suggestion of the EWG? Um, I remember we, there were mention of advanced technologies mm -hmm. in energy infrastructures, and I'd like to think the underground installations of transmission lines is something considered as one of the good technologies, but I think it's quite uh, costly and, and expensive. But I'd like to think that with the APEC cooperating with one another, trade and investments of this modern or advanced technologies, we can work it out as a region to help out each other, maybe not only in terms of technical assistance, but maybe pricing and financing among the APEC economies. So I'm quite positive in that area. Yeah. I think uh, financing issues in particular are something we're gonna be looking at. And each region, of course, is quite different. Uh, what we found in this, for example, in the southeastern U.S. is that uh, the, we had backup pumps and things in place, auxiliary power in place for gas stations. Uh, electric lines above ground were very um, tied down. But we realized after what happened in New York and New Jersey that that area of the country didn't do any of that. So it's really sharing the best practices for the types of infrastructure people have now and then how to move forward with new infrastructure. Yes, ma'am. Hi, good afternoon. I'm Ads Mirafalor of Manila Bulletin. I just uh, want to ask, um, how are we going to relate our APEC hosting, the Philippine hosting for uh, energy minister uh, ministers meeting to the common tao to the people. Um, I mean, how are we gonna tell them that hey, we're in, we're spending money for these meetings uh, just to assure for the next few years that we will lessen the power interruptions in the country? Uh, how how are we going to explain to them these meetings? Thank you. Well, I, I guess the. The, the media, uh, the government media, particularly in, in Cebu, have been doing some information dissemination or awareness campaign so that uh, people would understand the importance of APEC, uh, why we're doing this, uh, what benefits could be derived at the level of Cebu being the host province, and then Philippines, Philippine economy in, in general, so we were able to uh, adapt um, emerging technologies in, in, in the energy sector. I think that will improve our energy infrastructures and systems so that we'll have, um, uh, can improve our energy su supply, uh, products and services. So it can translate to uh, uh, benefits um, on the ground, uh, people on the ground, like we're mentioning there, um, the use of clean energy in energy poverty stricken areas. So these are use of um, clean, clean energy, renewables, maybe the distributed generation. So all these, uh, for example, the electrification projects, because we're talking of access of people to energy products and services. I, I just add, I think being the host economy for APEC gives that economy a chance to put on the radar screen of all 21 members those issues that are of a special importance to them and get more attention and more work done on them. Yeah, if I may add, just this morning there was a discussion on small and medium enterprises, but we, we see that Philippines also ha have these micro enterprises, and these are some of the items that we have to put forward because we take into account one of our, our very 
uh, important objective is, is inclusive growth. Mm -hmm. Not only for the Philippines and I yeah. think uh, to other epic economies where it should be applicable. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Eric De La Cruz from Reuters. Uh, you mentioned uh, certain action plans that are being discussed at the APEC level, such as uh, the doubling of renewable energy capacities and the reduction of energy intensity. Uh, may, may we know whether there are uh, specific actions that uh, are being discussed at the APEC level in order to achieve these uh, goals? And are these uh, commitments on the part of the APEC members? Um, every APEC is voluntary, so these are aspirations. Uh, leaders set aspirational goals for the decrease by 45% in energy intensity for the region as a whole by 2035, um, and a doubling of renewables as a share of uh, power by 2030. Uh, so what the Energy Working Group does is put together portfolios of projects uh, based on what the gaps are in the region to help everybody build capacity to reach those goals. And for energy intensity, which was a target that was adopted in the US year, we're actually, which was quite aggressive at the time, I should say. We had lots of discussions about how aggressive that target was. We're actually more than meeting it and staying on target. So we develop, it helps us define our work program of what we need to be doing to help all the economies. And if I may add, there are two working groups in APEC uh, under the Energy Working Group. So these are Energy Working Group on Energy Efficiency and Conservation. This is particularly uh, doing energy efficiency mm -hmm. and conservation so that the target for reducing energy intensity is taken care of, like they do roadmaps and all sorts of things. And in fact, they had a meeting in Cebu uh, sometime last week of August. And then there's another experts group on new and reno renewable energy technologies. This particular group uh, handles, among others, that aspirational goal of doubling the share of renewable energy is, will be attained by doing some programs. And in fact, this year, they met in the Philippines, uh, in Ilocos Norte. Uh, that was sometime March or April to do the roadmap and to really um, define what the action plans or programs are in order to attain our aspirational goals. Uh, one last question, ma'am. In terms of energy security, are there any discussions at the APEC level uh, on how, 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 how one uh, country will help another country in terms of uh, making sure that uh, everybody has uh, achieved a certain level of energy security. I think we take the term broadly. Uh, we do things to encourage diversity of supply, diversity of uh, types of energy, et cetera, to build energy security. We undertake uh, emergency exercises uh, where we have all the economies sit together the experts and uh, put forth a scenario so people can practice sort of going through what they would do if there's a disaster. Uh, so really almost everything we do, do contributes to energy security. The gentleman in the third row. I'm Brad Ritterson and I don't look like it but I am from Cebu Daily News. Um, <laughs> I'm also from the United States, so I understand that very, very well. In Hurricane Sandy, I had many mm -hmm. friends that were hurt badly in that. Um, one of the questions I was going to ask is you talked about resiliency, energy resiliency, mm -hmm. and that word keeps coming back again and again. I'm curious about specifics on either technologies or things that are being looked at for that. At least as I understand what I believe you mean by that is that if we have something like what happened here in Tacloban when Yolanda uh, breezed through, just is saying it in one way. Uh, it was months and months before energy systems were restored 
the economy began to recover, people be able to get their jobs back. This is independent of the loss of life and property and everything else, which was horrific. Uh, I'm just wondering what specifically maybe has been brought up, discussed, whatever, as, as either technologies. You've talked a lot about best practices and use that phrase, but I'm sure there were specific things of this might work, this might work, especially in this region. Thank you. I'll give one example. Uh, if we go back to Hurricane Sandy, something that the U U.S. has put a lot of money into and um, work into is creating very resilient microgrids so that if one area goes out, you can probably call upon a microgrid to uh, send energy out to, say, hospitals, schools, the most important places. You might have an industrial park that has an advanced microgrid that operates on not just uh, the grid, but off-grid, like has uh, solar panels and et cetera. And we build in ways for if there's a disaster that strikes that those microgrids can come back up very quickly and supply the most urgent needs in the area. But that's just one example. Apologies, but we have time for only one more question. Uh, Dr. Yoshida and the Undersecretary have to attend bilateral meetings. Uh, going once. Uh, yes, ma'am. Good afternoon, I'm Daphne from Business World. You enumerated proposals under the Cebu Declaration. Can we just ask what's your timeline for this? In your initial estimate, how long will, how many years will it take you to complete the implementation of these proposals? <laughs> I think it's a combination of short term, medium term, and long term. Like for example, our uh, project on resiliency in upgrade areas, we should have done it by June, end of June 2016, so we're starting to work on it. And then a lot others are, I think, are not really doable in a very immediate term because, for example, there was a mention of energy mix policy. This is something like a work in progress that each economy may want to do their evaluation and at the end of the day maybe come up with a policy that prescribes a certain energy mix considering diversification of fuels and um, uh, other, matter, other things that will have to be uh, con uh, considered like environmental aspects of the energy mix and maybe the, the, the cost and, and what's, 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 what are the indigenous resources in certain economy, uh, APEC economies. So these things are, are some of those, but we have prescribed some timelines for those that we can. And for the others, it's something like it's exploratory or, or an evaluation at this point, but hopefully to be completed uh, at a certain timeline that can be, uh, it can be that. Yeah, it's a combination of short, medium term, and long term measures. So things like uh, training a workforce that's able to really to do work with renewables. Many um, uh, of the economies don't have a good workforce in place. So it's working to bring people who can actually help bring things like advanced microgrids online and run them, along with perhaps some of the easy lessons, like I said, in, um, in New York, we found that we had standards for utility poles in um, Texas that were able to withstand hurricanes, but the standards for utility poles in New York were different and were not as strong. So things like that can be done relatively quickly. And then there's a longer term piece of research and training, I think, that needs to take place. But that's the advantage of APEC. We've been meeting for 25 years as the Energy Working Group. We're one of, we are the biggest group in terms of projects and funding, and we stay on task. And just a follow-up on the investment earlier. Uh, you mentioned that you cannot yet 
provide the necessary amount of investment for the APEC. But after the meetings, will you be able to provide us the figure and also the available financing options that you will discuss? <laughs> yeah, APEC doesn't provide financing. What we do is talk about different models of financing. For example, the ESCOs where uh, companies come in and will build energy efficiency and then take their fee over time in terms of the savings. Uh, we work with uh, different economies with the Asia Development Bank and others to define what it really takes to get the investment that you need. Yeah. It's a fun way for us to just uh, maybe promote public-private partnerships okay. so that the private sector comes in more particularly in financing and maybe right. technology. So. Um, okay. We would like to thank the Undersecretary and Dr. Phyllis for uh, taking the time to speak with us this afternoon and to everyone for your participation. This concludes our press briefing. Good day, everyone. <laughs>